of our, we'll resume the program at this point. Again, I'm Ed Juris. I'm the uh, president of the governing board of NOACA, and it's my privilege to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, County Executive Ed Fitzgerald. You know, in my other life, I am the director of regional collaboration, so I work for Executive Fitzgerald, and so it was natural when this, the staff uh, said that they were looking for a keynote speaker, they came to me and said, well, you know, Mr. Fitzgerald, would you ask him if he will, he will speak? And I'll be honest with you, he was a little reluctant at first, and I said, well, this is a pretty prestigious organization, a lot of public officials and whatnot. And he said, you know, it's, it's, I've been working pretty hard, it's, it's June, it's summer, it's Friday, I don't know. And I said, well, you know, the keynote speaker gets one of these engraved pens, <laughs> and uh, it, it closed the deal. So, uh, so we're very fortunate to have, uh, to have Ed Fitzgerald here. And, uh, you, you know, he's been a county executive now, I believe, about a year and a half. And it's interesting because he tells a story that uh, when the charter form of government was created, uh, the Plain Dealer did an article about who's going to be the county executive well before the campaign started and had about 15 pictures of potential candidates, and he was not one of the candidates uh, that they thought would be on the radar screen, at least for that deserved a picture. Um, but uh, another thing I knew, because I was in the legislature for, for nine years, and I talked to a lot of people about the county executive position, especially the, the first county executive position, and a lot of the seasoned politicians were shying away from it, and I, I couldn't understand why, because people were saying it was going to be the second most powerful position in, in Ohio, next to the governor. And people said, well, you know, that's going to be a graveyard for somebody's career because whoever gets in that first year is going to have to make so many cuts and so many changes and upset so many people that they'll be finished and it's the guy who'll come in after him that'll be the, the big success. But we found uh, in, in the year and a half that we've had that that hasn't been the case, that uh, County Executive Fitzgerald stepped forward and having been an FBI agent, having been uh, an attorney, having been uh, a councilman and the mayor in the city of Lakewood, step forward to take on this position, and uh, I think the results have been very dramatic. Uh, we have a, a very good relationship between the county executive and the county council. He's trimmed the payroll there. He's uh, a lot of innovations in terms of uh, economic development. We have, for the first time, a $100 million economic development fund. Uh, we had uh, some of the leaders throughout the state come and, and the county come to meet with the executive after about nine months in office. And I always remember that uh, Gene Krebs, who served with me in the legislatures from the Columbus area, said, you know, everybody in the state is watching Cuyahoga County because they see nothing but good things happening up here, and they're wondering if they ought to change this form of government, of county executive form of government. Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, in these months to have a new direction. We talked a little bit about it today, how involved uh, NOACA has been in changing things. The panel discussion, uh, what Ari Marin said about the, the transformation, the revitalization of downtown. It's an exciting time to be living in Cleveland area. It's an exciting time to be in Cuyahoga County. And uh, a big part of that has been the work that Ed Fitzgerald has done. So we're very fortunate to have him here today to talk about uh, an update on the new and improved Cuyahoga County. So please welcome County Executive Ed Fitzgerald. Good morning, good afternoon. What is it? It's the afternoon, right? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Ed, for a very nice uh, introduction. It's always very safe to have somebody that works for you introduce you, because you know they're going to do it right. Thank you for the pen. And it did not influence my decision in any way. Uh, Ed, I'll donate it back to you if you like, just to make sure. We have to be careful about that with the, the history that the county has had. Uh, you know, something that Ed said was, uh, was, although with the previous scandals, I don't think it was about pens generally, but uh, Ed said something that I, that I think is so true, and I think it's something that public officials tend to say whether it's happening or not, but it really is happening, and that is, uh, that we're at, a, we're at a certain turning point in our county's history and in Northeast Ohio's trajectory. And that's typical, I think, kind of political rhetoric. People like to say, 
this is the most important election, or this is this, you know, every election apparently is the most important election, uh, or that this is a particular moment in time when everything uh, could change. And uh, we like to think that maybe we should always act as if it was that kind of a crucial moment, but it, uh, it usually is not. There are times where change moves at a snail's pace, and there are other times when um, everything kind of lines up in the right way. And that's what we've had happening in Cuyahoga County. And, but that's just an opportunity. The, the, the door opens and uh, folks from the private sector and the public sector have to walk through the door once it's open. If you look at the great reform movements in American history, they almost always started uh, with a scandal. Because usually great reform movements don't come about because people gather in a room like this and say, well, things are going pretty well and we're actually doing uh, a nice job and things are, people are pretty happy, but let's change them anyway. Let's, let's do something radically different. Because even if people have an idea of how something could be done better, things have to get worse for them to have the motivation to do it. And I think it's, it's even more than things have to be dysfunctional, there has to be a very easy way for people to understand that things are dysfunctional. And the easiest way for people to understand that there's a significant dysfunction is a scandal. So the great progressive movements that started at the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s in this, in this area and across the country, they, the, the fuel to that was, was individual instances of, of corruption or mismanagement or disasters. And then people decide they're going to do something different. And it's the same thing in private industry, by the way. So if you take the airline industry, let's say, and you say, well, why did the airline industry change to where they have all the different safety regulations that they have now? It was after, it was after a series of catastrophic plane crashes. So it would be nice if uh, these things happen in a more rational, planned way, but that's not the way that, that it works. So what you'd had in Cuyahoga County is you'd had really a hundred year conversation and it literally went on for a hundred years uh, or more about whether or not we could do something uh, dramatically different in terms of the way that we govern ourselves here. Because a hundred years ago people diagnosed that we were becoming fragmented. A hundred years ago about 80 percent of our population was in Cuyahoga, or was, I'm sorry, was in the city of Cleveland. But people realized that as the, as the city continued to grow and as population increased, that eventually there would be more and more political fragmentation and that the population would start to go out into the surrounding suburbs. And some very far-sighted folks said that if we don't do something now to coordinate our services, it will be more and more difficult as population continues to move to the outer, uh, to the to, to farther out into other suburbs and even other counties, and they were correct. So they made, but they made a number of different attempts, but maybe they just didn't have the right public officials, or maybe they didn't have the wrong public officials because the scandals apparently weren't big enough to really get it done. So in when when the scandal broke in Cuyahoga County in 2008. That was the community's big chance. It was, I don't think it was looked on that way, because at the time, it was looked on as saying, oh, this is another piece of bad news. This is another you know, punch in the gut for Northeast Ohio, that, that this is the way some public officials and some contractors are behaving. Uh, but really, it was, it was an opportunity. And we had different ways that we could have responded to that. The community could have responded in much different ways. And and I can let me let me just give you an example of something that I've, I have Ed mentioned some of what my biography was. So many years ago, in the 90s, I for about three years I investigated political corruption in the Chicago area, and uh, which has been known to occur out there, uh, as you may have heard. But the, the, in the area that I investigated in particular was a, a town, and I don't know how many of you are very familiar with the Chicago area, but it's area of Cook County called Cicero. And Cicero is, is like the corruption capital of Cook County, which is saying a lot. Um, we, we, there was an investigation that I was heading up at the time, and it continued, it started before I got there, and it, I think it's still going on, basically, and it's been 
it's, it's, it's been going on for decades, I guess. But there's a very successful particular investigation where almost everybody went to jail. The mayor, the police chief, the treasurer, uh, and on and on and on and on and on. And a bunch of folks that were active in the local, uh, local organized crime syndicate. They all went to jail. They all went to jail. And there was no reform after it. There was no reform. As a matter of fact, I remember talking to people in Cicero. I got to know a lot of people that worked there, business people and, and regular residents. And they were totally nonplussed by the whole thing. And you'd say, well, doesn't this, you know, doesn't this make you angry that this is going on? And they said, no, that's, just, that's the way it works. That's the way it goes. So after this whole cast of characters was th that had dominated the town for a couple decades, after they were all thrown out, they were just replaced by the exact same thing. And people voted them right back in again. Didn't have any effect at, uh, didn't have any effect at all. As a matter of fact, some of them were reelected while their indictments were still pending. No problem. No problem at all. That's when corruption has really penetrated to the whole society. And that's what we didn't have happen in this county. We had individuals that were, but the people of this county had the exact proper response once it all became public. They were disgusted by it, and they said we've got to do something different about it, and they, they tried to do that in different ways, but it has resulted in a county, in a, in, in a county government that's, that's reform-oriented, and that's what, we've tried to, that's what we've tried to give them. The reason that I think that the timing is so good with this is because sometimes you have kind of a renaissance that happens in the private sector. You have an economic boom. Sometimes you have that happen uh, in, in civic space, and sometimes you have it happen in a government space. And what we have happening is it's all happening at the same time. And that was not by design. It just, that's just the way it happened to be. So you had, your, you had your political scandal happen at the exact same time that the economy had hit bottom and was starting to come back up. And you have all of these projects that we know that are going on right now. So all of these things are happening at the same time. And at the same time, you had a lot of the cultural institutions like whether it's MOCA or the Cleveland Museum of Art or Playhouse Square, they're all enjoying a renaissance at the same time. So for all these things to happen at the same time is, is really, it, 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 they're playing off of each other. So what we're able to do is complemented by what they're doing and what we're able to do is consistent with their message. And what that does then is it starts to, again, it's not cheerleading. It's not just trying to get people to believe in something that's not there. It's really starting to change people's minds. And we do know that that is happening now. We, we know it objectively. I'll, get, I'll give you two objective facts, and I'll get to my, my, my presentation. I'll give you two objective facts that, that, uh, that give me confidence that this is real. One is that uh, you can judge how people feel about their area by how they uh, how they vote on, uh, on tax levies and renewals. Uh, and we had a human services renewal in March that passed with uh, about 70% of the vote. It was the largest margin that we'd ever had in decades in this county. And it passed out of 59 communities, it passed in 58 out of the 59 communities. And the 59th community, it tied. So it didn't fail in any of the communities. That wasn't typical for Cuyahoga County never passed by that much, and there are certain communities that almost always would vote no, but not this time, even in some pretty difficult economic times, not this time. And the 59th community was, was Gates Mills, and they've had a tough time recently, so they, they just, they felt they couldn't do it. So I understand if you're from Gates Mills, it's been tough. In the run-up to the, in the, run -up to the uh, human services levy, we did some polling that I think is fascinating. I don't know if you're interested. I'm interested in, always in data, and as Ed and my staff that are here know, we try to do everything based on data, and I'm fascinated by polling and, and, and polling data, um, even when the polling questions are not about me. Uh, so, so we asked, how do people feel about their county government? How do they feel about... Uh, Ohio, how do they feel about the country, how do they feel about Cuyahoga County and Northeast Ohio. Here's what's interesting. One is um, our approval ratings for what we're doing are off the charts. I mean, they're just off the charts good. 
especially in an area, era where government is generally not held in high esteem. Um, numbers are s over 70 percent, and the disapproval is only about 12 percent. Just unheard of numbers, and, and that is that is noteworthy, and that was gratifying to us. But we also ask people, how do you feel, besides government, how do you just feel about the area? And what it showed was people were unfortunately pessimistic about the country. Uh, they were pessimistic about the state of Ohio in general, but they were optimistic about Northeast Ohio and Cuyahoga County in particular. That is the reverse of what many people traditionally would think had been the attitude in this area for decades. And I always, I, I talk to people about this sometimes, I would say, you know, I, I do believe that the area is kind of, has been suffering from collective low self-esteem or, or kind of a defeatist complex. I don't know exactly when it started. I think it started sometime in the, in the 60s or 70s. But uh, I think we are almost out of it in terms of public perception. We're not, we're not there yet, but it is, it is changing. I've seen it in the poll numbers. I've seen it just in the conversations that I have with people. And I think you probably have too. Now, the way we manage what we do in the next few years, I think, will determine whether or not we really get out of it once and for all, and whether or not it's just a, a temporary spike in people's opinions or whether or not it's uh, something that's really going to last. But uh, I, think it's, I think it's real, and it's happening, and it's a very exciting time to be involved in public policy, um, because who wouldn't want to be part of that? And we know the rest of the state, as Ed mentioned, is talking about it, and we know the rest of the country is even starting to pay some attention to it. So let's uh, proceed, if, uh, if we could. When we put this uh, uh, PowerPoint together, it didn't have uh, any graphics or anything in it, and um, somebody said, well, let's, we need to jazz it up with a lot of photos. This is the only photo they came up with. Um, I don't know who that is, but... He certainly does help that. No, Howard, this is my, where are you, Howard? This, this, is, this is my opportunity to publicly thank you for the incredible work um, that you have done uh, for so long. Um, in a time where a lot of uh, regional entities and county entities certainly have been in, in turmoil and transition, Howard was really a, uh, a rock of integrity and reliability. He was somebody that we always knew that we could count on for um, abs the absolute highest standards of uh, professionalism, and, uh, and we're all the beneficiaries of it, and, uh, and I just wanted to personally, on behalf and on behalf of the county, express uh, my gratitude um, to you. Um, and I hope you enjoy your, your, your uh, retirement. It's, uh, it's well-deserved. So let's, let's talk about where we were and where we are. I've already talked about, talked about this a little bit, but this basically just goes to my point that um, we, had a, we had a decision to make, whether or not we were going to try to do things dramatically differently or whether we were going to try to do things uh, in, a, in a totally uh, status quo way or we were going to head in a different direction. Here's the, uh, under the old system, and I know most of you, most of you know this, but uh, the old form was, and this is your typical form of county government in every single county except Summit County and, and and, uh, and Cuyahoga County, and it's three commissioners and all the associated line offices. Our, our new form has one county executive, 11 county council members, and Chuck Germana, who's one of our council people, is here, I see, in the audience, uh, a prosecutor in our, in our um, court system. The county charter d did a, several different things. One was it, cons it did this consolidation that you see in this slide. But it also listed a number of aspirations for county government. One was that it was going to be more efficient. So it wasn't just, it, the, the hope wasn't going to be you were just going to take everything you did before and just have a little bit different organizational chart, but that you really would consolidate functions. Secondly, that uh, the county would become a major player in uh, certain issue areas, especially economic development, but also a few other issue areas where the county really hadn't taken much of a role, including higher education. And then thirdly, that the county would start fulfilling a role as really being a regional leader, leading regional discussions uh, about shared services and, and shared 
uh, strategies. Let's go to the next one. Um, I mentioned this before, but uh, I'm a little ahead of myself, but the, the part of it, again, at Summit County and ourselves, um, we're actually the most consolidated, and we're actually one of the most consolidated across the country. There are, there are lots of county executives all over the United States, but a lot of them do still have more individual uh, separately elected officials, whether it's a sheriff or a fiscal officer or whatever uh, the, case might, uh, the case might be. So what were our priorities upon uh, taking office? Well, first of all, if you take over after a scandal, you have to restore public trust first, because if you're going to start with all kinds of policy initiatives, you're going to be putting the cart before the horse if you haven't established trust with the people in the first place. They're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt to do anything new. And in a regionalism context, cities or other entities are not going to trust you to take over any of their functions or uh, be in a joint service agreement with them if they're wondering uh, what your level of integrity is. Uh, so number one was to uh, restore trust. Secondly was the efficiency that I mentioned. And in, by investments, I just mean what are those issue areas where we felt that we could, after all of our efficiencies were done, what could we uh, where could we make a strategic investment to, uh, to change the landscape here? I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to get to any questions that you might have. But uh, we'd been in office for about 45 minutes. We passed a, or had a temporary ethics code, which was uh, the strictest in the state. And then the county council eventually um, adjusted and modified that. Made it even more. You made it even stronger, and then and then codified that. Every single employee must go through ethics and training, uh, ethics training, and every single vendor has to do that. And we got a lot of grief from that from a lot of vendors. But we wanted every vendor to hear from us uh, what our expectations were. And all of these scandals. Uh, or almost all of the scandals that the county was involved in, when they were two-way transactions. There was a corrupt public official, but there was a corrupt vendor. And we never wanted a vendor to ever again be able to say, well, I just thought that's the way the county worked, so I had to go along with it. And I thought I wouldn't get any work if that happened. Part of our ethical code for vendors is they have a mandate if they are approached in any inappropriate way by a county official, they must report it. And if they don't do it, then they're going to end up being banned as a contractor. And we set up an independent inspector general where they can make those complaints. So if they say, well, I heard Fitzgerald say that, but he's a politician, I didn't believe him, fine. Go to our inspector general. Don't talk to me about it anyway. Talk to the inspector general. She's a former federal prosecutor, former Manhattan uh, district attorney. Deal with her. And then she'll do an investigation. She'll refer it to law enforcement for any legal uh, ramifications. She'll refer it to me for any personnel actions. This has happened a no number of times, by the way, this year, and it has worked exactly as it's designed. She'll do a quick investigation, not like the FBI, which I can tell you from personal experiences, it usually takes from three to 50 years, it seems, to complete an investigation. It's done quickly. It's turned over to us. There's been a, several employees. I get the report. They're terminated. The whole thing from start to finish, two weeks. Compare that to five years. So it's very important, I think, if you have, yeah, a, a, an ethical code is meaningless if you don't have administrators that are willing to live it and back it up. And I think it's also meaningless in a large organization if you don't have the independent ability to investigate it. If you're w waiting for outside law enforcement uh, to solve your internal culture problems, you're, you're looking to the wrong entity. You've got to embody those principles. And just transparency, and that is everything that we do. We have 10 times more information about what we do on our website. And our default position is always to disclose information. And we don't just disclose what we have to disclose, and we don't just disclose what we're asked for in a public records uh, request. We try to disclose everything that we do and do as much as we can uh, in public. I just want to say a word about, uh, 
the, what we do with county stats. Some of you are familiar, and actually I see uh, the folks from RTA are here. They use a, a, a version of, uh, I think you call it transit stat or something of that kind. And there have been a lot of public partners, RTA is one of them, that we've asked to borrow some of their, uh, some of their approaches. It comes out of, as, as many of you probably know, uh, something that was originally called CompStat in New York City, and then it was called CityStat in, in Baltimore. We used it in uh, the city of Lakewood. I applied it to every department in Lakewood. Uh, and, and as I said, there's other entities like RTA that have used dis different versions of it. It's nothing more than a, a rigorous and disciplined data-based system for measuring performance uh, by function of county government. Every single function that we do in county government that we can define is, is subjected to that process. So that could be everything to how much overtime are we incurring, to what are, what's our sick leave usage, to how many vehicles do we have, to how many employees do we have per task. That is, I cannot overstate to you how important that's been in terms of changing the culture at the county. Why? Because when the county in the past would have financial challenges, they would use uh, wh what I call budgeting for dummies. And that is they would try to figure out what did they need to cut, and then they would just tell their directors, okay, everybody's got to take a 3% cut. You figure out how to do it, or a 5% cut, or a 7% cut. We don't do it that way. We do not do it that way. There's, there's, there's several things wrong with that. One is it treats every department as, as, as if it is equal which they are not. They're not equal in terms of their efficiency, and they're not equal in terms of the value of the services that they provide. Certain services should not be cut under any circumstances. Other services are uh, more things you would want to have as opposed to needing to have. So it, it's, it's simplifying and kind of dumbing everything down. Uh, the, 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 second the, the second problem with it is the urgency to become more efficient is only there as long as the mandate is there. So you get to your 7% and you're a manager and now you're home free. Well, maybe you had 50% that you could have reduced, but you have, you have met the goal. And we're always struggling against that attitude with our directors because we say, just because you're under budget doesn't mean you're done because we have other things that we'd like to do with your money. But if you just tell every director, cut X percentage and they do it, that's where the analysis will stop. The other thing is, um, efficiency is, is, should be a constantly kind of self-reinforcing goal, and it shouldn't be based on whatever the crisis of the moment is. So yes, the, the state cuts were very challenging to us, but we didn't want to just say, well, once we deal with the state cuts, then we're done, and then we can go back to the way we did things before. So you have to have this attitude that you're constantly going to be challenging uh, your own assumptions, and that's what County Stat does. Has it worked? It sure has. We're about 450 employees smaller net uh, than we were uh, when we took office 15, uh, 15 months ago, and that has been done without any cuts in services, and it's been done at the same time that we're providing some services that we didn't provide before. That tells you two things. It tells you we were overstaffed. And secondly, it tells you that we're, we're going about this, I think, in a, in a methodical and effective way. There's lots of other things we're doing uh, to try to become more efficient, but we're not, uh, I don't want to go into it um, uh, in too much detail. Let's go to the next slide. It, what are the things that we're making investments in? Well, a lot of things. I'm just going to mention um, a few of them. One is the county is actually spending more money on early childhood education than it ever has before. The state, of course, cut back on some of its support for that. And we are trying to make up the difference with that and expand, and, and expand it. Why? Because we know that when it comes to spending in the social services area, there is no single category that we think has a greater transformative effect than money that's spent in the early years of a, of a child's life. And so we're, uh, we're, we're doing more than we have before, and we've been working with our local foundations on that. College access, we're going to announce a program this summer that... I can't talk about yet, but it's going to be one of the largest college access programs of its kind um, in the United States. And we've reserved about $6 million out of our budget 
so far uh, to help pay for that and other college access uh, uh, initiatives. We're doing that for two reasons. One is we are mandated to do so by the charter. It's in our charter language. Secondly, our college attainment rate in Cuyahoga County is about 10 points behind the national average. It's dismal in the city of Cleveland. Under 10% of adults in the city of Cleveland um, have a four-year degree or more. 9%, 9%. So now, countywide, it's about 25%. But that is, a, uh, that is a prescription for disaster. We know that most of the jobs created in this century are going to require some kind of significant post-secondary education. So to have a workforce uh, where 75% um, don't have four-year degrees and a huge percentage don't have any kind of skilled occupation is basically sentencing a huge portion of your population to, uh, to poverty or near poverty. So we've got to do something about that. Law enforcement, we, have, we established a community policing unit of, about, of 12 new sheriff's deputies. What's, what's interesting about that is there's hardly been a police force or a, a county that has added deputies in recent times because of state cuts to the budget. The fact that we were able to actually put more deputies on the street is unusual. And it was, it was based on something I did in the city of Lakewood where we, again, we cut our budget, but we invested in law enforcement. We increased the number of police officers by about 10%, and our crime rate in Lakewood went down by about 18%. We can't do something that dramatic in Cuyahoga County, but we're helping, and it's been a big, it's been a big success so far. It started to be deployed uh, city by city. It was in Warrensville Heights, it was in Euclid, it was just in Fairview Park, and uh, it, it's, a, it's an important, assistance to local government. The $100 million Economic Development Fund, Ed mentioned a little bit, it is funded by, it's basically a bond, it's not a voted bond, it's a bond, it's bonding capacity that we have. The county council passed it a couple months ago. It's based, I won't go into too much detail about it, I can answer questions if you'd like later, but it's basically, most of it is reserved for local, small and medium sized businesses that have private capital, but they need some help to expand. Uh, and we've had a great response from it so far. Here's something that I think is very important. And by the way, it was funded, it's funded by about an $8 million commitment that comes out of our general fund, which all came out of efficiencies. So all of these things are related to each other. Uh, this is something also that I think is very important. And again, it, it shows, it illustrates my previous point that there's commitments that are being made on the public side and the private side. So when we made our $100 million commitment, we went to the top 25 financial institution, lending institutions in Northeast Ohio and said, will you partner with us and make a commitment to match this amount in additional small business loans? And they agreed that they would. So there's another $100 million of private capital that is going to be linked uh, to this. Um, uh, casino revenues, I just would, uh, would mention, um, and for those of you that are out of town and feel like losing some of your money, it's open and we'll get some of it, I guess, so, so please do so, I guess. Um, we're just trying to, we, 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 we have not settled yet with the council how those funds are going to be dispersed, but here's what we did do. We didn't budget any of them. So we passed a two-year budget. We're the first county, I think, in the state to pass a two-year budget, and we didn't, we didn't use a dime of the casino revenue. And that was a big temptation because we've had to make lots of uh, difficult decisions and they would have been easier if we could have said, well, we know some casino money is coming. We said, we're going to try to reserve that to, to make a strategic investment so that we can use those funds to do something the county has never done before. We didn't want to do it just to make up for the state cuts or make up for uh, decreasing tax or flat tax revenues. We wanted to try to reserve it to try to do something uh, that would be uh, transformative in some way. Now, Chuck and I and his colleagues on council, we're, we're deciding exactly what that will, will be, but I think, I think there's at least an emerging consensus that we're going to try to target it in a way that's going to make a, a big difference for this um, uh, community. I want to talk a bit about just 
regionalism in, in, in general, there's two aspects to it, really, the way we look at it. One, are the, one is economic development. The other is the efficiencies that we can try to gain by combining our, our services. We, I think we have a problem. We still do. We had a problem overall in this county in that uh, people didn't identify themselves with the county. They identify themselves with their specific city. And the problem with that is when you have 59 different cities, um, you're losing the, the, the power that you have in your numbers and your economic strength because you're subdividing it by 59 ways. So if you take a county of 1.3 million people and billions of dollars of economic activity, that's a huge force to have a coordinated economic strategy. But then if you divide it up 59 times, you're, uh, you're really competing against yourself as opposed uh, to your competition um, across, the, uh, across the world. One of the reasons we, that's one of the reasons we created this position that Ed now holds as uh, Director of Regional Collaboration. And it includes all the different aspects of collaboration and, uh, and regionalism. Go to the next slide. One, probably the most apparent thing that we've done when it comes to dealing with other government entities is our, um, our anti-poaching agreement, which the formal name is Business Attraction and Anti-Poaching uh, Protocol. Uh, these have been done across the country. They have not been done to this extent in Ohio, although Franklin County is, is now looking at doing it um, with their cities. We've, I think we're at 39 now, didn't we just, uh, oh, we're at 40 now? So now we're out of 59 communities, 40 have now uh, signed on. People, uh, may, you may have no idea how difficult uh, that process um, has been. Uh, and Ed has done just a yeoman's job on it. Because you think about it, these are decisions that had to be ratified by uh, 40 different city councils and 40 different mayors. So your average council probably averages about seven members. So you're talking about 280 council people uh, plus another 40 mayors. So you're talking about 320 public officials who are being asked to do something that they have never been asked to do before. It isn't high on their priority list a lot of times. There's a lot of rivalries and they're not used to thinking about this. And they're dealing with a county that they may have some residual mistrust over. So it's been an extremely delicate process uh, that Ed has had to, to go through. I don't think he had any gray hair when he took the job. Look at him now, he's a wreck. <laughs> no, you look great, Ed, but he's, but uh, it's, it's, it's really been a, a, a big success and, and it, to the point now where every single community, by the way, over 25,000 has now signed it and it represents about um, 81, 82 percent of the population of Cuyahoga County. So, and, and we're not done yet. The other 19 haven't said no. There actually have only been about two communities that have officially said, um, have officially said no and we're not even taking that as a no, we're taking it that as a, as a not yet. Uh, but I think we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to be there with virtually all the cities in, in Cuyahoga County eventually. There's all kinds of other things happening. I already mentioned the $100 million fund. There's all these projects. And here's the thing that, again, going back to why people should be positive, I think, about what's happening. We're not in the position of some major metropolitan areas that were in a depressed state economically and you pass some kind of a tax levy and you say, okay, we're going to have a downtown project. And we're going to build a stadium, let's say. Okay. We're going to take a bunch of public money, we're going to build a stadium, and then say, okay, we're, we're a comeback city. That, almost any area can do that. That's not what's happening here. So let's just take Cleveland, for example. I'll skip the suburbs for a moment. There's plenty of success stories in, in the suburbs. But just if I just use the city of Cleveland, for example, you start on the far east end, you start uh, in the University Circle area, you have several billion dollars worth of projects that have happened there in the last couple of years. Between a $150 million project at the Cleveland Museum of Art, billions of dollars of, of uh, hospital construction and renovation, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, a new hotel project, new housing there. Now you go down the street and you get to the Cleveland Clinic, again, billion dollar projects, a huge expansion up and down in both directions on Euclid Avenue. Then you don't have to go too far. I mean, you don't have to, this isn't like trying to plant something in the middle of a dead area because you don't have to, you can literally drive this and every few blocks you're going to see something. 
Then you get to Cleveland State, which is 100% uh, better than when I was a student there. So you, you have tremendous progress going on at Cleveland State. Then you get to Playhouse Square, and there used to be kind of a dead zone between Cleveland State and Playhouse Square. They're growing into each other, and Playhouse Square has all kinds of exciting expansion plans. Then you get to East Forth, then you get to, uh, and th there's uh, restaurants springing up all up and down Euclid now, and then you get to the casino area, then you get to the what's happening with the medical mart, which is ahead of schedule and under budget, and we're making great progress with the number of conventions we're going to bring to town. Then you get to the East Bank of the Flats that we just did the topping off ceremony, and there's going to be phase two to the East Bank of the Flats. Then you get to West 25th, and there's been a renaissance there. You get to the Gordon Square Arts District, and pretty soon you're to Lakewood, which has been a paradise for a number of years now. So you have this huge... Now, you didn't used to be able to tell that kind of story. If it was just an artificially created boom because you, you subsidized something that never would have happened, you wouldn't have this. You wouldn't have this. So there is something really special happening, and we're not the only ones that think that. People that are coming here are noticing the difference, and they're, they're talking about it. Um, let's go to the next one. And we're, um, it, we're also a part of these discussions, and NOACA has taken a leadership role in these. It's everything from Regional Prosperity Initiative, the Sust uh, Sustainable Communities Consortium. I will say that most of our function in county government has been internal, as I mentioned. We're going to start dealing more with our, our partners in other counties as, as time goes on. But again, we felt like we had to get uh, our own house in order. Um, if we go to the next one, I'm going to go through here a little quickly. I want to get to any questions that you might have. Um, we also have had this this whole conversation with the 59 cities, not just with the no poaching agreement that I mentioned, but also shared services. And here's basically what um, what 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 my vision has been with this. And this will run into the next slide also. The regionalism discussion was missing something. What it was missing was when it came to municipalities was. There, there weren't practical, immediate steps that local governments were, were being asked to do or were, being, were given the opportunity to buy into. So you would, you'd have this big picture conversation, but you wouldn't say, okay, it, it, this is what it means, this is what it looks like, this is what we, you, we we're asking you to do. That's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to make it a practical conversation. The way that, I, the way that we're trying to address that is we're, we're taking the brand names off who provides a service. So you look at all the services that a city provides, and then you look at all the services the county provides or any other entity provides, and then you say, who, is, who else can provide these services? And can the county add on to its menu of services so that every year the county adds two or three additional services? The reason why I think this makes so much sense is you're not asking a city to give up its identity. If they want to do everything they're doing the way they're doing it now, they can do it. If they want to say, you know what, we don't need to do our own road maintenance. We don't need to do our own IT services or health insurance or HR services or bridge repair or whatever the service may be or dispatch, whatever the service may be, we want to provide them those menu options. And uh, I don't think there's any question that this is, this is the only way, it, as a practical matter, that it's going to happen in this county. And for people that don't think it's going to happen, we, we've gotten used to some of the other regional examples of that. We just didn't expand them. Best example, some of you heard me, heard me say this before, every city in this county, if they wanted to, could have their own health department. If they wanted to. They could fire the County Board of Health tomorrow if they wanted to. And at one time, almost every city in this county did have their own health department, but they decided that the county health department had the reputation, the expertise, the efficiency, the integrity, that they were willing to write them a check once a year and say, here, you do it. That's going to be our challenge. That's the way we're going to make this a de facto metropolitan government. If we're able to say, here are 20 services, you pick, you pick them off the menu the way you want to. And then as time goes on, if we prove ourselves, people will be more and more comfortable in saying, yes, we're going, to, uh, we're going to do that. But we will always hold, as a municipality, we'll always retain the right to take the service away from you if you don't provide it in a way that, we, uh, that we're, that we're uh, um, approving of. 
uh, this goes into the next slide. Actually, I'm going to let's go ahead and and and, and skip through this. Um, I think I pretty much covered this too. Let's go to the next one. Next one. Oh, good. Questions and answers. <laughs> That's what we've been working on. I hope you like uh, what you've seen with our uh, uh, progress so far. NOAC has been a wonderful uh, kind of precursor to the kind of cooperation that we're talking about. Um, and so we're happy to, to continue to work with you and, and, and take Howard's legacy and work with your new director and, and hopefully continue to do great things with you. And I think Ed's going to be, uh, is going to handle some questions and answers, right? Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, we'll just have a few minutes now before the Earnfeld Award. So if anybody's got a question for the county executive, we've got a microphone there. Microphone there. If you raise your hand, we'll get it to you. Oh. There's got to be a question out there. Now. All right, there's Dan Troy. <laughs> you know, Ed, I think what you've shown up there uh, shows that you know the the, the, uh, the ability to to provide uh, the ability to provide uh, uh, county government services, which are primarily state mandated, you know, has become more efficient. Uh, uh, and, and let's be let's be honest, when when this was proposed. Uh, a lot of the political establishment, the existing political establishment, opposed it. They right. said, "You know what? We don't need a new system. Right. It's just including me. That's it's, right. It's just bad players." Uh, and I agree with you. The only way you've been able to do this in Ohio in two counties is corruption has driven it. Uh, how do we get to the point where? Because I think this makes sense in my county to some degree. Maybe not not as extensive as yours. It probably makes sense in a lot of our counties in the state. How do we get to the point where this thing can be sold? Uh, I guess. Uh, on its own merits, uh, rather than you know needing to have corruption uh, drive it to take place. Right. Well, and Dan and I have had this uh, discussion, and he's been willing to take some political risks in Lake County to to to, uh, to start this conversation going. But I have told him that I thought the the easiest way to pass it in Lake County would be for them to have a big county corruption scandal. And I think you may be the man for the job. <laughs> I, I, you know. You know, that's a sacrifice you may you may have to make. That's right. Uh, you're trying, I know, but um, so uh, I think you're right that that's why it happened, and that's why it happened in this county. There's no question about it. The and I've been watching. I can tell you, and you know this better than I do, but there have been conversations in other counties. There's a serious conversation going on in uh, Montgomery County about switching. There's a serious conversation going on in. Uh, in Lucas County, there's discussions in uh, the Mahoning Valley and a couple different places in the Mahoning Valley. Um, my analysis of that is those, it probably isn't going to happen in any of those places, by the way, because there isn't the, the outrage against the, the, the current system. Um, I think here's probably, I don't know that it's going to be sufficient, but I think here's, the, here's why we we can play, and I know I don't preach to those people. I don't tell them you have to you have to do this, but I think government responds to what's measured, and the measurements of things are have a power in and of themselves, and and I think that's true for the private sector. I mean, let me put it this way: you compare it to the private sector. A, a private sector CEO knows that if it's a publicly traded company, that they're going to be evaluated partly on what the share price is. They know that the quarterly earnings report is going to, to matter in terms of how their board evaluates them. That's what's missing in government in general. I think it's missing in city governments. I think it's missing in county governments. When I became a mayor, I was, I was appalled at the lack of kind of discipline about best practices and what's efficient and what's not that's out there. I think the discussion is very amorphous and, and, and kind of anecdotal about this stuff. And I think that the way to do it, I'm not saying it would solve the situation because I think different counties will decide to go different, different ways, but the way to try to give some ammunition to folks that are trying to push for, for creativity and some consolidation is to have some report cards that go out there and can tell people very specifically, you must be telling me I'm out of time. <laughs> Wow, it's getting even darker. Um, is tell people very specifically, this is how much this is costing you. I, I want to give you one, one quick example of what I'm talking about. We had a very disjointed IT uh, infrastructure in Cuyahoga County. 
because you have something called the ADP board. You know that. You deal with it in the county. Okay? And then all the individual departments had their own IT people. And then you had the law enforcement IT stuff. And then you have the court system IT stuff. Right? So we're one of the only counties now in Ohio that we have one chief information officer that is combining all this stuff. But, and, and we've saved millions and millions of dollars on it. But, but here's the thing. There are established standards of how much should a government entity be spending per capita on IT. You, you know, it, it is a certain percentage per employee. How many thousands of dollars are you spending on IT per employee? And we were overspending. We're now dramatically below the national average. But that's where public policy has fallen short. Because instead of having these kind of uninformed, it, it would be great to me if editorial boards or good government groups would be able to say, well, OK, uh, county commission of XYZ county, here are the benchmarks. And how come you're behind on all these things? If you can get to those efficiency levels with three commissioners and all the other elected officials, that's, a, that's great. But if you can't, then you should have to, the, those elected officials should be forced to have a very frank conversation with their constituents. But, but it's never been monetized to that extent. So the discussion is like the discussion that we had in this county where people would say, well, I think it could be more efficient. And other people would say, well, I think that you're giving up your rights to elect all of your elected officials. And that's basically where the discussion ends. We got to put the, we got to get the data involved. We got to get the data involved and that the data will change the discussions. Same thing in Cuyahoga County with the 59 community. Eventually our 59 cities, again, when I was a mayor, we never had people come to us and say, hey, Lakewood is spending more because of this, this, and this, and this. I mean, it just didn't, ha those, that didn't happen. And I think the county can play a role with that. I think some of the nonprofits and other, other parts of the civic conversation can help with that. I don't think it's a guarantee we'll get to what you're talking about. But I think it would at least create some political pressure uh, that might help. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. We went over here. Um, I, I think you had, you had to buzz by that slide at the end, but uh, you, know, you started talking about data. I don't know if you can bring that back as GIS, and, and, and I guess that it's a question about collecting that data, and when you talked a lot about, Ed, about the, the surveying and the polling, what mechanisms are you using to do that? How, how are you accomplishing that? Surveying and what? I'm sorry, surveying and what? You're, you know, you made a joke at the beginning about polling, and you're you're gathering oh, okay. data, you're getting feedback, you're yeah. and yeah. showing and being able to share that. How how are you accomplishing that? Well, they're two they're two separate things. I mean, the the, the one the, the one is in terms of when we try to find out what people's opinions are. That's that's different. That's public opinion polling, and we're trying to see what's the sense of what's the public buy into what we're doing. When it comes to um, when it comes to GIS and, and so forth, I mean, the county had put a lot of money, millions of dollars into its GIS capabilities, but they were only used, uh, let me put it this way, they weren't necessarily used in a uh, cross-departmental way. It was seen as a public works function, but it wasn't necessarily seen as how do you use that type of data to, uh, to have a law enforcement strategy? How do you use that type of data for a social service strategy? You know, I'm only scratching the surface when I'm talking about uh, combining strategies. The, the regional discussion in Cuyahoga County has mostly been about economic development. But just think about law enforcement, and I, I was in law enforcement for eight years, so I tend to think about it maybe more than some county officials do, but just think about the implications of having no coordinated law enforcement strategy in a county of more than a million people. Just think about it. I mean, you've got 59, actually you have more than 59 police departments because there's some hospital systems and others that have their own security forces. So you've got about 65, that's not even counting all the federal agencies, you've got 65, 70 different law enforcement agencies in this county and they're not necessarily using crime mapping data or, or, or anything of that nature to coordinate their resources. It's crazy. It's crazy. So we still have a long way to go with that. The other thing is that all public officials here have to struggle with this issue and I struggled with it as a mayor is when it comes to transparency. These things, as I said, these things are all links in a chain. So your, your data that you collect, 
you also should always default on the side of providing that data to the public. So if you use crime data as an example, there's plenty of cities that are very, very sensitive about their crime data being publicized because they're afraid that it's going to be bad PR. And I think that is a, a 20th century way of thinking. Uh, we just have to be open about here's what's happening. And kind of, it's almost kind of crowdsourcing your, your, your research because you'll see that people will see that data and they'll make much more informed public policy discussions because then they have um, access to the data. And, and I've been, and I guess I would just close with this, and I know we've, um, we've got to get to uh, uh, the award that's going to be um, given here. Um, I've really been um, pleasantly surprised and gratified by how much kind of the, the civic community here has engaged in what we're doing. There's a lot of interest in it, more interest than ever before, I think, in county, in county government in this county. So there's a lot of appetite for this kind of stuff. Um, and, and so people are, are kind of soaking this up as we put this, this data up there, and it leads to a much more informed uh, public discourse. Um, it, it's not as political, it's not as partisan, it's much more pragmatic, and it's much more data-driven. So I think data is kind of contagious, and, and I hope what you'll see is that we'll continue to use all these you know, uh, GIS resources and everything else we had that we were using internally. We're going to try to communicate them more publicly than we ever have before. Thank you all very much for listening to me. I appreciate it. Well, uh, uh, thank our county executive for taking the time to speak to us today. And we do have a uh, key to the region with his name on it and an engraved pen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.